little bit on my background and how I got interested in writing about Qatar. I actually was a professor at Qatar University um, in Doha for one year from the year 2007 to 2008. And I taught um, mainly Qataris, which might sound normal to, to you in the audience, but in fact, that was quite a rare thing. Um, most universities in Qatar are primarily um, occupied by foreigners and non Qataris. So I taught Qataris in, in segregated classrooms as well. So I had a section of female students and then a section of male students as well. And while I was there at Qatar, I became very interested in how um, the society worked and I wanted to learn more, but I found that there was very little scholarship on Qatar and that in fact, the last book on Qatar was written in 1979. So I want to give you an idea of what my agenda is going to be for this talk, just an outline ahead of time, a little bit of a warning about what I'm going to talk about. Um, first of all, there's, I'm going to give you a little introduction on Qatar, um, and then I'm going to propose that we really need to think in new ways about these Gulf Emirates, in particular Qatar. We need to reassess the way we think of modernity when we think of Qatar and when we think of the Gulf. So I'm going to review the standard Western notions of modernity and show how they don't quite really fit to Qatar. So I'm going to start off with Durkheim and Marx. I'm going to talk about Weber's uh, concept of, of Islam and modernity. And then finally, the um, famous anthropologist and theorist Gellner. In the second part of my talk, I'm going to talk about how the Amir Diwan, that is the Amir in his court or his government, is creating a tradition of monarchy um, and inventing, in a sense, a tradition of monarchy where one did not exist before. So I'm talking about how this invention of a tradition of monarchy and heritage of monarchy, uh, monarchogenesis is a term that I like to use, as opposed to ethnogenesis, is really beginning to change this new model of modernity in, in many ways. And then in part three, I'm going to talk about the future of this system and how potentially as the Emir begins to isolate himself, he, there, there may be an uncertain future in Qatar. So a little bit first about Qatar, a background about Qatar. You have all heard of Al Jazeera, I'm assuming. That comes, of course, from Qatar. And it comes from Qatar because Jazeera in Arabic can mean island, but it also can mean peninsula. In a sense, because a peninsula can act as an island. And in this sense, the Qatari Peninsula has acted in many ways as an island for Qatar, both in, in the sense that it isolates it from neighboring cultures, it allows it some level of independence, but also leads to a great deal of interaction as well. Um, Qatar, of course, juts out into the Persian or Arabian Gulf. This is a very important issue if you, are, if you go to Qatar or to the UAE, it's important that you say Arabian Gulf. Otherwise, it's considered that you um, think that Iran should own it. So <laughs> the Arabian Gulf, from the Qatari perspective, um, so it's in a very volatile region geopolitically. Always has been, in fact. Um, here's a closer view of the Qatari Peninsula. Uh, the capital of Doha here. The capital used to be actually Zubara, which when uh, Qatar was a client of Bahrain up until the 1870s, Zubara in the north. And there are many reasons to study this small emirate. Um, first of all, the economy, for those interested in money, it is the second highest per capita GDP in the world, um, $104,000 per person. And this is dividing up the GDP with all inhabitants of Qatar, not just the Qatari citizens who only are 10% of the population. Okay, so that's greater than Luxembourg, UAE. And it's the largest liquid natural gas exporter in the world. And it is a type of Jazeera of stability. Um, it, is this, it is the forward base of central command, CENTCOM for the United States. Um, and it practices a form of what I like to call real politique, <laughs> using the Qatari real to 
<laughs> to influence the course of events um, to its favor, in the sense um, Qatar has spent a great deal of money on the exterior, on what, is, on what it is doing in international affairs, and there's not been very much uh, of a view, very much research, or very much of a lens onto the internal workings of Qatar, which I'm going to talk about today, and important for us as well, the Arab Spring was financed by Qatar to a great deal. And Qatari um, fighter jets, in fact, even participated in the downfall of Gaddafi. Um, there is a personal vendetta with Gaddafi and the Qatari Amir because back in a conference at the Sheraton Hotel, a bunch of Libyan terrorists allegedly tried to blow up all the sheikhs of the Gulf. So Qatar is very happy to get rid of Gaddafi. So this is what 450 trillion cubic feet of natural gas in the north field can do to your economy, right? So we have basically an exponential um, growth in, in gross domestic product um, with a slight bump here in 2009. But this, uh, these are World Bank figures. Qatar's GDP is really on a, a very rapid speedboat uh, race. And lest we forget, another reason to study Qatar, um, and this is a reason that Americans may not appreciate quite as much as Europeans, is of course football or soccer. Qatar beat out Germany and England and other major players to be the host of 2022 World Cup. And Qatar's influence, in fact, has spread so far in the football world that it is sponsoring the Football Club of Barcelona, the best football club in the world, in my opinion. Yes, it even has my name on the back. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll just put that out there for, for you to remember. <laughs> and this is a, this is a uh, plan of what the a completely air-conditioned summer summer stadium is going to look like, and they're still insisting that it's going to happen in the summer. 125 degrees. Okay, so the despite this great importance of Qatar, there is a lack of scholarship. The last book that was written on Qatar, scholarly book, was by Rosemary Said Zahran in 1979. And since then, there has been a plague of coffee table books, basically pictures with very small captions about Qatar, financed by generously by the Qatari Dewan. And again, the impetus of most of the real politique coming out of Qatar is to externalize the focus. So there's no real internal critique or criticism within Qatar. Al Jazeera has done only a few pieces on, on Qatar itself, mainly, for example, on the National Day and other things. And there's um, emphasis on journalism writing over, over the social history and the social dynamic and even the politics of Qatar is left out. And finally, I think it's important, um, as much as I appreciate the discipline of economics and political science, to realize that there is more to these societies than being oil containers. They, are not, they cannot be simply described um, by a universal rubric as rentier states, that is states where uh, citizens don't pay taxes, they receive and are dependent on the government, and where there is one resource being oil. It, what matters, and an argument that I'm making here, is the actual social, pre-existing social networks and, and structure within these societies, and in Qatar in particular. So you need to study each of these situations, each of these rentier uh, models individually, is my argument. Okay, so a stereotypical view of Qatar, this picture I took in a moving vehicle. Also these, uh, this is in fact the Villaggio Mall where that horrible fire occurred. Uh, but, you, but essentially you are recreating um, a dreamland uh, of air-conditioned luxury. Right, where you can move in between um, without really having to expose yourself to, to the environment. So I'm talking here about four major themes. Um, 
first of all modernity that qatar and other gulf states need a new model we need to reconfigure the way we think of modernity also memory that they that their traditions do still matter and that they are remembered within the qatari population as much as this narrative is beginning to be transformed by the monarch and also the myth of monarchy the development of a monarchical tradition within qatar that is at variance with what our historical sources tell us so basically the new math that is being promoted sort of like new math in elementary school is that nationalism is monarchy which is greater than lineage and memory okay um so first the first part is qatar as a new model of modernity although we use these theorists and these scholars and their ideas are very important for understanding and framing the way we think of the past and the way we think of societies. Um, Emile Durkheim, Weber, Marx, Gellner, David Haldun, simply using them and applying them and attaching them to Qatar is similar to putting a square peg in a round hole, is, is in my opinion. Okay? So Durkheim, what does Durkheim say about modernity and change? In a very quick slide, <laughs> I am generalizing here. I do apologize, I cannot go into too much detail. But according to Durkheim, modernization um, leads to a traumatic shift, basically, from who you are, that is what your name is to your family, how you relate to an extended family network, something that we only have residual experience of today, a shift from that dramatically to what you do, so to a division of labor, to, um, to what you are matters um, according to what you do in your profession. It's interesting here in America, one of the first questions that is asked is not what is your family background, but actually what is it that you do? As if what you do is what makes who you are. In Qatar, it's, it's actually the exact opposite. It's your family and your background that makes you who you are. And what you do is uh, still secondary. So Durkheim studied what happens when these family networks break down. These family networks did, contrary to popular belief, did exist in Europe as well at some point. And he came up with this idea that uh, he studied the effects of the division of labor and showed that there is a heightened incidence of suicide. And, and he called this anomie. Anomie is this sense of angst that comes about from losing your family identity and being pushed into the division of labor system. So one would expect in Qatar that this would happen. So here's an image graphic of the transition from a romanticized family life to the division of labor. So one would expect in Qatar that there would be this true and extensive anomie that would exist. Since Qatar in the 1940s was little more than a miserable fishing village with fly-infested hovels, according to the political resident. This was during the time of the times of hunger when the pearl price had collapsed. The Mikimoto pearl, which was an artificial pearl, had just been discovered in Japan. So the old pearling tradition in Qatar was no longer viable. And this was before oil was really starting to be pumped out of the ground. So these, at this time, Qatar was actually in a worse off position than most of the world. It was the complete opposite of Qatar's position today. It was perhaps one of the very poorest countries. And this is within living memory of Qataris today. These years, are, these years of hunger are still recounted by old sheikhs. I happened to meet one of them. He was quite dramatic about describing these fly-infested hovels at the time. Okay. So, and then as soon as 1965, this turned into a sprawling city, almost magically, right? So if you could imagine within a matter of, of a decade, your entire world becoming something completely new and restored. So it becomes a sprawling city of concrete buildings, traffic, traffic lights, conventional big city. So we go here from um, the late 1940s, these the 60s, and then to today. Right, where Qatar is 
at the very top, indeed, of the pyramid of, of modernity and of development. Okay, and here we see the, the effects of this economic development on the population, right? This really, really it does mirror the, the graph of GDP that I showed earlier, right? And uh, something important to note that only 10% of the population is actually caught to aid, the rest being expatriates. <laughs> so Durkheim's disconnect is his is assumption that lineage is something that is inevitably broken um, by the process of modernization, but Kaptar really shows that that need not be the case, especially if you have expatriates to take on the anomi, in a sense, expatriates forming 90% of the population, um, externally exporting the negative effects, essentially, of a division of labor, of the development of a, of a modern economy. And we see that lineage is preserved in such things as voting patterns. Um, one of the documents I worked with was an internal pamphlet called Awol Beit al Demokratia fi Qatar, the first um, democratic house in Qatar about the municipal elections. And it basically showed quite distinctly that the people being elected were being elected primarily according to tribal affiliation. So lineage groups maintained their prominence even within, even when they're institutionalized into a, a so-called democratic system. Um, housing is uh, modern, very much so, but maintains, again, the same lineage um, patterns. Even in the settling of the Bedou, and this is very interesting, uh, the Bedou, Bedou being Bedouin, refused to settle in certain parts of the city where the Hadar, that is the settled people, used to be. So the Bedou, we will only be in Ryan because we don't want to mix in with the Hadar because we're still Bedou. Even though we're living in a house now, we're still Bedou, which is very interesting. So the Bedou Hajar. Another is saying, well, we're going to and also in business and, and economics, there is the development of cooperatives or sharikat that are based essentially on family or, or tribal lineage groups where the profits of these, of these cooperatives are shared within the tribe. It's even divided in higher education. Basically what I found while I was teaching there, it may have changed a little bit today, but pretty much Education City, which is this grand project by Sheikh Moza, Perhaps you've heard of it all, Georgetown University, Northwestern, Cornell, Weill are being sent perfectus in totem to Qatar. Most of the people going to Education City are from the al Thani, that is from the royal family. And most of the people going to Qatar University are from the other tribes um, in Qatar, such as the Saluta or the Bani Hajar or the Mahari or the Doaini. Um, and I want to say that really Qatar still maintains what I would like to call a majlis community as opposed to an imagined community. Perhaps you've heard of the notion of an imagined community by Benedict Anderson, this idea that nationalism is an imagined community that needs to be imagined because there's not this, the face-to-face -face contact that, de that develops loyalty within traditional systems. But within Qatar, it still remains possible, although it's beginning to change, for Qataris to be a majlis community, that is, a community based on these uh, tribal councils. Okay? So civil society does exist in Qatar, but it exists as these informal groups, these lineage societies. And I want to show you a couple pictures. Of, for the Qatari slang for majlis is mailas. What do you do in the Qatari Mailas? Well, you basically resolve internal situations within your tribe without other tribes knowing, is the real idea. If there is a crime or a situation within your community, you don't want it to necessarily get out from there. And you don't certainly don't want the state really to get involved, or the Emiri to want, unless there is a conflict with another lineage group, okay? And you'll find these within each of the um, lineage settlement compounds, each of the tribal settlement compounds, um, usually on the upper floor. 
And also it's a place where you can drink coffee, you can just hang out, you can get to know each other, and you can um, uh, barter in this currency, this very important currency that's called wasta. Wasta being your connections, your connections with others. Wasta is what buys you position within society in Qatar, not necessarily your monetary wealth. Um, it's very important to understand that. Okay, wasta. And in fact, in the 1970s, this is Tehran al Khalij of the Gulf Airways at the, at the Doha airport. It was even possible in the 1970s for Qataris to travel without a passport, right? Because everybody actually knew one another by face. So, I know you, Miriam. Sure, you can get on the airplane or get off. Of course, I know your family. <laughs> it wasn't necessary to have all of these official documents. And everything else. So just imagine if your society actually functioned that way. And then um, imagine that it still really functioned that way even within uh, a very modern context. Okay, that's the extraordinary thing that's happening here in Qatar. And remember that picture I showed you with all the fancy tall buildings? It looks like a modern dreamscape. It looks like something out of, I don't know, Frankfurt or New York or something. But if you look at the substratum, the lineage networks remain on the ground. Okay? So this is called the Farij system. Each of these little boxes here is Doha. This is a map of Doha. Um, is basically claimed by a different tribal unit here on this list. The, over in Ryan would be the Bedu. There's the um, Khalifa, which is very prominent. Um, community. Um, so each of these would be where most of the people from that lineage group would settle and maintain their, their position. If you're a foreigner, what do you do? You can still live within these districts, but the land is owned, of course, mm -hmm. by Qatar. The one place where foreigners can buy land is in the Pearl, which is a new development that was dredged up and sort of like the um, Nakhil, the palm tree in Dubai. So here's a, a modern, this is just a Google map that I could show it. Um, yeah, so I read this right there. The Hitmi, the uh, Salata, the Sulaiti are very important. They, in fact, and I'll mention this earlier, they used to be the Sheikhs of Qatar in the past. But that's not remember. Um, okay, Max Weber on Islam and capitalism. So Max Weber, a very important sociologist, of course, he doesn't talk as much about Islam as he does about um, some other places and religions such as China, but he does say some things, and what he says is rather um, ungenerous. Um, he suggests that uh, the religiously conditioned structure of the Islamic formation, its officialdom and its implementation of law, impedes industrialization. That only the Occident, that is only the, the West, knows rational law. That rational law is something that comes out of Europe, the United States. Only in the Occident is found the concept of the citizen in the city. So, in the Orient, is this notion of urban anarchy. So, everything just kind of hobnobs onto itself organically in, in his assumption about the Islamic city. In Qatar, we don't really see Qatar fitting this model. First of all, um, in Qatar, we're dealing actually with the Wahhabi sect of Islam. And most of the time when we hear Wahhabi, we associate Wahhabism with Saudi Arabia. We associate it with a very stern, strict, and unyielding implementation of actually a very modern interpretation of Sharia that has been imposed. Um, and in Qatar, um, they don't follow directly the teachings of Ibn Abd al-Wahhab as strictly as they do in Saudi Arabia. And most, and, and a little bit about the history of Wahhabism, they really adopted Wahhabism to get the Saudis off their back, right? So the Saudis wouldn't have any excuse to come in and take the territory. Um, and the pearl trade, which is a part of the pre-modern history of Qatar, meant that Qatar was constantly engaged in cosmopolitan activities. It was very much a, a peninsula, very much an island, a place of the sea. 
and you would have, for example, the Sheikh of Qatar go off for six months into the Arabian Sea, into Hyderabad, where he would meet with his Indian wives, and he would sell the pearls, and then come all the way back to Qatar. So you had this sense that it was a Wahhabism of the sea. It wasn't a Wahhabism of the Bedou, it was a Wahhabism of the sea. Um, that, it, that even Wahhabism, which we think in our minds is this unyielding form of Islam, even Wahhabism is adapted to the cultural environment in which it's found. This is why it's very important to look at the particular cultural and economic and, and um, geographical context for religion. So perhaps one could say that Doha is too busy to hate, rather like my city of Atlanta. Um, and what Weber, one of the things I want to argue here is that what Weber terms urban anarchy can really be seen as informal civil society. That simply because it is a lineage-based group doesn't mean it is incapable of adapting itself to, mod to modernity, right? That I think this is one of the assumptions that is, that is really made in Western historiography, that there must be this gradual evolution from a lineage-based tribal system that is very primitive to a much more glorious industrial system um, and so on. That actually these lineage-based groups can form, as we see here, Nasser bin Khalid wa Ali bin Ali, the Sharika, Mu Kamalun, Amuamiyun. This is a general contractor, right, of one of these cooperatives that is uh, tribally-based. So we have the almost immediate transition from a traditional um, society to, I really like this camel being. <laughs> These are actually, this is trade, and it's very important for Ramadan, of course, to have trade in sheep and camels, right? So. Another aspect of Wahhabism of the Sea, and I just, I'm going to go on a little bit of a tangent here because I think it's very important, is um, the prominence of Qatari women, which is uh, always fascinating to people when they visit Qatar. They think, well, why are we in the Arabian Peninsula? Why are women in power? Um, Sheikh Amoza has 10 times the Facebook likes as the, as the Emir. She leads the Qatar Foundation. She's really the most powerful person in Qatar, if you ask a lot of people. She's the favored wife of the Emir. He has two others. Um, or the public wife. And women, of course, far, out, far, far outnumber men in education. It's worse even than in the United States. Um, and an interesting aspect about the history of the Tamimi and the Althani, who are Tamimi from the Tamimi clan in Saudi Arabia, is that they probably, there's indications that they have something of a matrilineal background, right? And even if we look back into the 8th century, that Famous prophetess Sajjah came from the Tamimi Confederation. And there's even a, a very a specific note within the Constitution that the heir must be, it must be seen coming from a Qatari woman. So it must be proven that he has gone through the birth canal of a Qatari woman, which indicates very clearly a sort of matrilineal um, obsession. Right? And there's this concept of a women's majlis. Um, remember the the mylas. It's not simply a men's mylas. It's also a women's mylas. That when men were off for long periods of time searching for pearls, women were basically left in charge of the villages. Um, and there are even instances I found evidence at the Al Khor Museum. This is a little town north of Doha that there were not nachodat that there were actually female pearl. Um, captains. There's a there's a legend about about this that I found. Have to verify that further. And you might wonder, why do I have a picture up here with my grandmother with an Althani sheikh, and not a picture of my mother and my sister? Well, one thing that we often forget when we think about Islam and sexuality is that men are also expected to adhere to certain norms of modesty. And this Al-Thani Sheikh made it very clear that 
although he was very honored by the possibility of having a picture with my sister or my mother, he could only have a picture with my grandmother because she was well past the age of being someone with whom Shuma with him, shame might be associated. So my grandmother's here having a wonderful time. <laughs> and she made it, of course, 15 hours on the airplane. This is at the camel race track, by the way. Another example of this Wahhabism of the sea, um, this, the emir is financing the building of Catholic churches. Um, which is completely against the rules in Saudi Arabia. In fact, we had the Mufti, the Grand Mufti in Saudi Arabia really getting irksome about this and saying we need to destroy all the churches on the entire Arabian Peninsula because it is the place of, of the Haramein, the place of the two holy mosques. But in Qatar, no, it's different. We, we do allow for pluralism and openness because of the tradition of, of that in Qatari society. And just briefly, I think Marx also makes, misses the mark with Qatar. You can imagine that Qatar is something of a speedboat, but Marx describes Western nations, big tankership economies, moving at a slower evolutionary speed. Qatar really has sped ahead, um, not in an evolutionary manner. Um, finally, Gellner also doesn't really give us a clear understanding of Qatar. In Gellner's view, Islamic society or Muslim society is fundamentally divided between the Bela de Siba and the Bela de Maksin. The Bela de Maksin being the realm of the ruler or the realm of the state. And just outside that is the realm of chaos, the realm of the tribes, the realm of unregulated anarchy. And according to um, the very briefly on Gilmer's ideas, there's these two forces within Muslim society, the, the centripetal and the, centri and, and the centrifugal. The centrifugal are those of, of the anarchy outside of the control of the state, and the centripetal is the state itself. But what I show really in Qatar, and what I have showed in my previous books, is that lineage groups need not necessarily be the antithesis of urban society or of of state structures and governments. In fact, they can become the embryonic beginnings of state societies and structures. And in Qatar, that is certainly the case, as it was for the Almohads as well. So. And uh, another thing that we need to remember about Ibn Khaldun, which was main inspiration for Gelmer, is that Ibn Khaldun needs context. Uh, this is one of the reasons why I really wanted to write this book which for some reason had not been written, the biography of Ibn Khaldun, because his ideas are simply taken and quoted without understanding why they're being written and for what audience. Ibn Khaldun was a minister of tribal affairs. His duty and his purpose was to go out, to ride out, and to gain um, the trust and loyalty of, of tribal chiefs outside of the, um, in, in order to make them alive with the Sultan, okay? So he had an interest actually in overplaying the importance of, of the power of these tribes, right? So this balance, this inevitable conflict that is described, Ibn Khaldun had an interest in really, in really um, pepping that up, okay? Finally, I wanted to include also a Qatari theorist, um, Sheikha Misnad, and she really, recognizes, um, in fact, is calling for maybe some more anomie within Qatari society, saying that the problem is that Qataris are not aware of some of the consequences of this change and that they need to become more aware of this. And she's very interesting. She comes from a tradition of, a very a somewhat rare tradition of, of resistance to uh, the former emir. That's probably why she is now in a position of influence again, because the former emir was deposed. And she wrote this very cryptic sounding book. It's a very boring title, The Development of Modern Education in the Gulf. But if you actually read it, it has all these wonderful details about how land was seized and how all sorts of um, uh, interesting things happened with the previous Amir. Okay. So this is how I would describe the new model of modernity in Qatar. 
it's largely stable and enemy free most of the enemy has been exported internally to expatriates and there's a creation of a type of citizen elite that is countries themselves are elevated above um, above the expatriates preservation sometimes heightening of informal lineage ties in business society and politics so so not only is lineage preserved but sometimes it's even enhanced by by modernity right that that by being settled in these in these four regions and by being engaged in these cooperatives, the lineage groups becomes even more important, not less important, or, um, through through modern change. And that it's an Islamic and global uh, type of modernity, and not based on uh, Western models. And then um, an interesting aspect, which we'll get into the second part of the talk, it is. It is a growing rentier economy and increasingly concentrated on the Mir and his Diwan. So as we get into the second talk, there we go. <clears throat> so the second part of this talk, um, I'm going to talk about the basically the what we get what I see as the beginning of a transition in Qatar, just in the in the process of, of occurring right now. Um, to borrow from the, the writings of Eugene Baber, who talks about um, the idea of from peasants to, fresh, for, to Frenchmen, that is, that the, uh, it used to be in France that peasants spoke very different languages. They didn't even know about the French state. Some of them that were, were brought into the military, they, they had no idea what indeed they were fighting about. But Eugene Weber talks about this um, active effort by the French state to turn these peasants into real Frenchmen, that is to create a standard French language, to create a standard French idea. And what I'm arguing here is that what's beginning to happen in Qatar is a transition from the autonomy of the lineage groups that I described before to much more of a centralized monarchical system. And I call this monarchogenesis, right? Or the invention of a tradition of monarchy. And first I want to make clear the reason why this is occurring is because uh, it used to be the case that the al Thani were not always the, the premier tribe within Qatar. They were really, and even when they were considered premier, they were really first among equals. They weren't considered to be absolute uh, ruling family. And as um, the work of this um, French-Polish anthropologist describes, only recently has the idea of the emir or the name of the emir um, been centralized into one person. It used to be the case that there was an emir al Khom, there was chief of the village, there was Raïs of there was there were emirs of different tribal groups. One of my students, in fact, Abdullah al Naimi, he used to he used to show me. He liked to show me pictures of his grandfather actually sitting on a throne uh, as the emir of the Naimi in Qatar, right? These, these traditions, these ideas that, well, no, emir is actually what, the premier person in your tribe, not the premier person of the state. These ideas haven't been completely forgotten, even though they have begun to be repressed by um, the Althani emir. Okay, so um, for this portion of the lecture, I'm, I'm relying on uh, the theory of the invention of tradition by Hobbes Baum and David Canadine, who, who talks about invention of, of tradition in, in, in the British monarchy. But of course, it matters a great deal more in Qatar because we're not dealing here simply with ceremonial power, we're dealing here with real power um, in terms of the implications of this invention. First off, we need to realize that in Islamic history, and traditionally in Islam, the idea of a malik, that is a king, is something that is that was used to be derisive, right? A malik is somebody who is possessive, someone who possesses things and is, is somewhat um, selfish. And in fact, if we, if we look at the early accounts, these famous accounts that are repeated over and over again in Islamic tradition of the first Arab conquests, when they encountered the um, the thrones and the 
and the uh, impedimenta of, of, of monarchy, the, the crown of Yazdgard the third, who was the Persian uh, Shah at the time, the Persian king, they didn't know what to do with it. They thought they'd maybe give it to the caliphs. The caliphs didn't want to wear it. They didn't want anything to do with crowns. Okay? So monarchy and Islam do not really mix. Unless, however, there's a religious justification. Okay? Unless there's a religious justification. So we see in, in Morocco this notion of the, of the commander of the faithful, and then we see in Jordan this notion of a Hashemite background if you're relatively prophet that gives you a certain level of legitimacy. But in Qatar we have neither of those things. However, this tradition of monarchy is still being invented, which is very fascinating. Um, it's very clear in Qatari law, the position of the emir, although it's supposed to have the people as the authority, if you really look at what the emir is allowed to do, there's this is the 2005, the most recent uh, version of the Qatari constitution. Uh, he endorses and issue laws. No law shall be issued unless endorsed by the emir and any other powers. Um, but this leads to an interesting situation, which sometimes the more power and the more centralization of power that you create, the less stable you become. Right? or the more isolated you become from potential allies within your own society. Right? So there's a certain level at which you have to balance both of these tendencies. Right? So this is the so-called king's dilemma. A centralization of power is required for social and economic transformation. Right? This discourages the monarchs from expanding the social base. And then uh, the political demands of new social groups impinge on the power of the emir. So this so-called king's dilemma, most political scientists expected all these monarchies in the Middle East to simply just go away, to perish, that they would be overtaken by a much more advanced system, right? But that did not occur. It is the Middle Eastern king's dilemma. And of course we have a little quote from Shakespeare. For now, actually, monarchy is only strengthened in the Middle East. If we look at the tendencies in the Arab Spring, the monarchs have remained, but the secular rulers have fallen. In Bahrain, for example, a, only in 2002, he just changed his name to Malik. I'm a Malik now. <laughs> it used to be that he was a mir, and even before that, he was just a hakam, or hakim, that is, a judge or a meteor, a person among equals. In Qatar, a similar process is happening, although he's not yet calling himself king. Um, there is uh, new laws of the succession, that succession should not be determined by a council after death, that it should be predetermined before the death of the emir. Right? Um, and uh, what's interesting is that people seem to be sort of going along with this in the short or medium term. But the problem is what happens when the current emir, who is Beloved is perhaps succeeded by somebody not so great. Um, and most of the so-called new social groups created by the expected um, king's dilemma are actually these expatriates, right? So the, this notion that um, new social groups are going to threaten the power of the emir is faulty because we haven't taken into account um, the role of expatriates. So the citizen elite are still relatively content. They just, uh, there was a 60% raise of government salaries just last year in the context of the, of the Arab Spring. Um, okay. But if we look at power and history in Qatar, um, we see that this tradition of monarchy is indeed um, invented. And we only need to look back to the Treaty of 1868 um, to see the, that it was really a British intervention that led to the freezing of the system that happened to, of a very dynamic system of power that existed in Qatar before. Before 1868, the, the notion of the emir or the sheikh, the, the first among equals, would move from tribe to tribe. Okay? So the Salati, it would move then to the Althani and to others. In 1868, 
um, a treaty was signed with the British that solidified Gil Fanny in charge. Okay, and here are just some of the tribes that used to be in charge in Qatar. So in many respects, the emir was something more of a merchant CEO. He was out there representing specifically Bidah and Doha. al Wakra, which was another village just down the coast, was represented by, by Al-Ainain, by a different emir who would go to India as well. Okay. What really changed things even further was when oil concessions were given by the British personally to the Emir Sheikh Abdullah, right? It wasn't given to the Qatari people, it wasn't given to the state of Qatar, it was given to his person, and you can read it specifically in the, in the documents. So the wealth that comes out of Qatar in the form of oil really is concentrated in the person of the Emir. And I, I really witnessed this invention of this monarchical genesis the very year that I was in Qatar in 2007 was the very first year of Qatar National Day, which is focused on the date of December 18th, 1878, when Sheikh Jassim, the great-great-grandfather of the current emir, um, expelled the Ottomans from Qatar. Okay? Sheikh Jassim. And this was the so-called Battle of Wajba. What's interesting here is that the focus is on the Ottomans. It's not on the father of Sheikh Jassim. This is a picture of the Wajba fort. It's not on the father of Sheikh Jassim, Muhammad bin Thani, who signed the treaty with the British. It's on this um, battle with the Ottomans. And it's on the specific line and person of Jassim. So Jassim is really held out as the hero of the nation, not the Qatari people. So there he is, there's the current Emir, Abdullah. And here's some images. I really think, I like this girl here, she has her fist. <laughs> okay, so again, prominence of women. Okay. So, in Qatar, it's not an issue of ethnogenesis, it's an, issue, it's an issue of the creation of a tradition of monarchy. That's really the argument that I'm trying to make here. And that it's these natural lineage communities that don't actually need to be invented, as they do in Western nations. They already exist and are, in fact, an impediment to the notion of Amiri nationalism. So that's very important to, to consider as well. That the traditional notion of ethnogenesis at the beginning of nationalism is upended. So tradition itself, in a sense, is modernized. He creates traditional structures here. Uh, Sheikh Hamad was actually the head of the Supreme Planning Committee. He creates traditional structures on what were previously actual traditional structures. Okay, here's the old Qatar National Museum, the new one. And he centralizes the archives. The notion in the past was that each majlis, each tribal community had its own archive, its own particular history. Um, Sheikh Hamid really wants to bring them all together into a central um, place and even create a cultural chic. Here we have Qatara Cultural Village, this magnificent museum by Ampey, right? A global Islamic heritage, a very vague notion. The idea is to create a vague notion of heritage and history without really provoking the question of, well, what were our powers and what was our position in the past? Okay. So I really see Qatar uh, in this last part as having a somewhat uncertain future. Even as power is formalized, um, there have been few real steps towards democratization, which is the one solution to the so-called King's Dilemma. Municipal, municipal elections uh, sides are only for Qataris who were there before 1935, right? And the, and the oil concessions. And no real concessions of power have been made by the emir. And in fact, and this is something very important to recognize, is that democratization does not inevitably lead to greater distribution of power. Sometimes it actually concentrates power further. Democratization, if it's only symbolic, 
what it does is it institutionalizes lineage groups and puts them under the purview of the state. So you have to be very careful sometimes. Oh, we're promoting democracy. We have these symbolic elections. In fact, is actually leading to a further um, centralization of power in the Diwan. So we have the attempt to move away from the Majlis Committee into a more um, imagined community focused on the Emir. And finally, there are heightened expectations for the future. So there are many paths that Qatar might take. It is uncertain which one it will. And with that, I would like to conclude my talk. Thank you so much. Thank you.